Hi, welcome to Bookmark. I'm your host, Don Noble. Today's guest is writer Mark Powell, author of five novels. The first three are set in Appalachia, and we might say the newest two, The Sheltering and Echolocation, are set in contemporary America and examine the effects on American culture of drone warfare and extreme interrogation. I spoke with Mark Powell at Northeast Alabama Community College in Rainsville, Alabama. Mark, it's good to see you. Thank you, Don. Thank you for having me on. Here we are at Northeast. This is your first visit to this college, I guess? Absolutely, yeah. All right, having a good time? Having a wonderful time. <laughs> glad to be here. Very have glad. they got you working hard? They've got me working hard, but I'm happy. I like to work hard, so. You gave a lecture this morning? I gave a lecture this morning. I'm going to give a reading later tonight, so yes. All right. Well, it's always fun to be up here. Mm -hmm. we, we get up here about once a year. You are a first-timer on Bookmark, which is our fault because you have five novels and we should have caught up with that before <laughs> today. But our viewers don't know you yet. Right. And you have an unusual biography. Mm -hmm. uh, you started off in the mountains, so to speak, of South Carolina. Yes. And then what? How, did, how does your life unreal from birth? <laughs> Well, so I grew up in the... Uh, in the extreme northwest corner of South Carolina, Don, right where the Appalachian Mountains sort of split the area. Uh, and I grew up with a fairly, I would say, uh, normal rural southern life. Uh, grew up in a, a wonderful, sort of loving, but very conservative church, uh, small town community. And I left that, I went to the Citadel, a military college down in Charleston, South Carolina. And I went there thinking that I would be a pilot in the military or something like along those lines, and that didn't work out. Um, I wound up getting an MFA eventually at South Carolina out of, after sort of accidentally writing a first novel. I thought I was in the process of writing down a family story. It sort of evolved as the things have a tendency to do and I wound up getting an MFA and eventually I wound up in Divinity School in Connecticut. All right, let's look back up. Okay. You went to the Citadel. Yes where you were an English major. Yes. Along with the Citadel's most famous, not yes. at the, uh, simultaneously, right. but the, the Citadel's other most famous English major. Yes, Pat was a little before me. I was, Pat Conroy. I was, yeah, Pat Conroy yeah. was a few years ahead. Yeah, but I, was, I wound up at the Citadel because of the Lords of Discipline. I read it when I was a junior in high school. A guy on the bus on the way to an away basketball game tossed it to me. And I read it and, you know, like most readers, I had that initial feeling of revulsion at the Citadel. And then there's that sense that slowly, for a few people at least, that revulsion starts to turn into an attraction. So a couple years later, I found myself there. An English major like Pat and an athlete, so doubly on the fringes of right. the Citadel Society. So you went to the military school, but did not join the military. Right. And it wasn't necessary at the time. No, the no. draft was not, no. not in place. Right. It would have been voluntary. He didn't yes. go either. No, nor did he. <laughs> yeah, that's no. right. Later, after uh, you you spent some time at the Yale Divinity School. Yes. You went to a military college, but did not join the military. Mm -hmm. You went to a divinity school, <laughs> but did not become a divine. Right. Why not? I, I'm a long way from the divine. You're right about that. <laughs> uh, I don't know. You know, it's it's something about I'm I'm drawn. Uh, simultaneously, I find myself both attracted to and repulsed by the idea of institutional authority. So I tend to frequently find myself pulling very close to that, whether it's um, ecclesiastical or military, and then um, pushing away from it at the same time. I don't know, I mean, I think that's sort of the nature of the writer, right? To try to have uh, your foot in each world and to sort of straddle that line between things. That doesn't answer your question at all, but I think that's as near as I can come to thinking why there are lots of people who are deeply interested in religion mm -hmm. without wishing to be right. a professional, sure. without wishing to be either mm -hmm. a preacher or a professor of religious right. studies. You just want to know right. more. Yeah. Something I noticed, look, just looking in, a, in the simplest way at your biography and then looking at the, in the simplest way at the five novels, mm -hmm. is that you've made use of sure. everything that 
that's in the life, the Northwest, South Carolina, yes, the Citadel. Uh, you're teaching in prison, mm-hmm. uh, military and ex-military. Right. Let's start off. The first three novels are uh, you're developing a reputation. You're gaining a reputation mm-hmm. as an Appalachian writer. Right. If people read only your last two novels, mm-hmm. they wouldn't think that so much. No. They're very, very contemporary and very American, right. in a yes. sense. The first three are much more along the lines of the Ron Rash mm-hmm. and, and, in a different way, William Gay and sure. the Rough South mm-hmm. writers, Barry Hanna, and, uh, Larry Brown, right. and so on. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, the writing sticks really close to my life because, for me, the writing is the way in which I try to make sense of the world. I usually don't know what I think about something until I sit down and write about it. Um, and it's usually after the fact that things start to, some bit of clarity starts to come to the whatever it is. So the world, I think for a long time I was trying to make sense of that Appalachian world I grew up in. And it, while I was writing these, of course, I was not living in Appalachia. I live in North Carolina now, but it's the first time I've lived in Appalachia since I was in high school. Mm-hmm. Um, so the fiction sort of followed the, the geographical and the uh, sort of larger spiritual and intellectual interest that I had over the years. Yeah. Um, so, it, so it wondered, certainly. Yeah, and I can, I don't know. I mean, I, I'm deeply imprinted by my life growing up in the Appalachian South, but I, in another sense, I, you know, I sense my writing drifting from that, but always sort of returning to it. Well, during those many years, 15 years or more, mm-hmm. that you were not right. up in the mountains, mm-hmm. you were writing about the mountains. Sure, yeah. And, I don't think you'd be offended if I suggest this reminded me of James Joyce living in Trieste. <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> li- li- living in mm-hmm. Trieste, writing about yeah. Dublin. Right. And he said Dublin was clearer in his mind sure. when he wasn't in Dublin right. than it was when he was walking the streets of Dublin. Is something like that at yeah, work in yeah. your first three I mean, books? Exile, silence, and cunning, right? That's, yeah. You know, yeah, the, the need to get some sort, of, uh, some sort of perspective on what it was, to see it from the outside, to go away, to see it change, to return and to see what was unchanging and and the ways in which it was evolving all around um yeah it was completely necessary and then you reach a point right where your world starts to change and the obsessions you have and the history you want to make sense of is not the history of your your childhood but the history of your adulthood uh and the history of what's happening to the people around you right the 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 immediacy of these experiences yeah i've always been skeptical of it uh was it uh, not Flannery O'Connor who said any anyone who's had you know reached the age of 12 or mm-hmm. something in the south has enough material for a lifetime of fiction right. I thought yes that may be true if you want to spend your life writing about 11 year olds right mm-hmm. if you want to spend if you want to mm-hmm. write novels about grown ups it, mm-hmm. it's better if you become one mm-hmm. sure uh, yeah <laughs> because those are the experiences that'll be useful but even you are yourself, a small pun embedded mm-hmm. here, a prodigal mm-hmm. in the sense that you left mm-hmm. and you've returned. But your first three novels are filled with such people. Right. They're characters who yeah. have left and returned. Sure. Yeah. And sometimes been in the military while they were gone mm-hmm. and damaged. Sure. You, those, those are Appalachian <laughs> novels. Those are novels mm-hmm. of poverty, right. hard, hard times, Yes. Like your friends Ron Rash and mm-hmm. David Joy. Sure. Trailers, rusting pickup right. trucks. <laughs> <laughs> yes. All of the all of the above, absolutely. I heard you speak about not glamorizing, not right. romanticizing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I mean what I wanted to when I was writing this especially those first three books, um, I, I read so much stuff that I felt like didn't portray the complexity of it. It glamorized it or it completely demonized it. And I was so, I, I guess the word would be, I was angry at, at seeing those sorts of depictions that lacked that sort of complexity. I wanted to write something that portrayed the world as I had seen it. And it was often dark. Um, and I think in hindsight, I, there would have been more light in those earlier books. Than I, than I granted them. And I know you're laughing because there's not a lot of light in the later books either. No, um, no they're dark. It, yeah, they're, they're dark, they are dark. But then, you know, sometimes I'll talk to people and they'll say, why are these books so dark? And I'll wonder, what world 
are they are you looking around at mm -hmm. right i mean mm -hmm. the, the immediacy of our day-to-day -day life is it's it's fine in fact i'm, I'm wonderfully i feel like i'm a well-adjusted happy person but when i look out at the world what i'm looking at is you know people drowning crossing the mediterranean yeah. and i'm looking at um violence poverty all over the world right the, the job of the writer as i've understood it and the job of the writer i've taken from people like Ron Rash, Larry Brown, all of you know, Flannery O'Connor, even Faulkner, was to look at the stuff that most people want to hurry past, right? The, the stuff that we want to avert our eyes from, that's the job of the writer. Or that's my job, I take it, as a writer. Who were, this had occurred to me when mm -hmm. I was listening to you speak earlier, who were the writers um, that you thought were being too uh, optimistic, too Pollyanna about the mountain south you know you, you know what I, you sure. understand i mean yeah apparently you, you you're, some of your writing is a response to what you thought right. was sugar coating mm -hmm. of appalachia i don't see very much of, of no that. no yeah well and you have to remember I, this was a point in my life when i wasn't reading what we would consider like serious literary uh -huh, fiction it uh -huh. was it would have been the genre stuff um and it would have been not just fiction, but uh -huh. all sorts of depictions in the media that range from, you know, the, the exploitation films to the, um, you know, the sort of cracker barrel sitting around, the old men laughing. Right. Um, yeah, I don't know. I'm not sure I can name There are names, series, though. Of, there are series of, of uh, small town, happy small town novels. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they're essentially the... Uh, it's a catastrophe. Mm -hmm. Junior has two dates to the prom. Right. I mean, that's know, the Mayberry rubbish. depiction, yeah. right? Of right. absolutely. Mayberry, yeah. perfectly good. Yeah. In one of your novels, you have a, a fellow who's Korean War vet mm -hmm. and damaged. Right. And the, one of the things that I've noticed as I went along was that that you have veterans who are damaged. Mm -hmm. Now he was damaged in Korea. Right. PTSD. Mm -hmm. um. mm -hmm. You know, with all the members of, extended members of my family who experienced war, um, grandparents, great uncles, all of these things, they were all wonderful, wonderful men. But asking them again and again over the years, every single one of them told me that they didn't find anything ennobling about that experience. They weren't better men for having gone through that. Yeah. Um, and, I, and I think that goes against that sort of larger Tom Brokaw greatest generation, that this is some kind of forge in which uh, modern America was made, right? The, the moving through Northwest Europe or the Pacific somehow changed, or Korea or Vietnam or whatever. To every single one of those men, they regretted that experience. They were, they were proud of what they had done, and rightfully so. But it wasn't something that was ever brought to me as this beautiful, wonderful thing. And that's, that's so antithetical to particularly to like a southern boy, the southern masculine notion that it's this sort of rite of passage, right? This oh, sort of sure. thing that you, you go off and you do this kind of thing. Right. So I always felt those conflicting, um, those impulses. One was that there's such a lure, right? To, to military, you know, especially a boy who grows up reading about the Civil War and the Second World War and all of these things. But then to hear these uh, stories or at least to see like the silence that exists that, that are sort of cradling these stories you don't hear um, you talked about, you know, going to a military school but not going to the military, going to divinity school but not going into the ministry. I think the same thing was true with the way I heard about war as I was growing up. It was simultaneously a thing that was ever present, right? Um, but it wasn't a thing that one should be. Yeah. My experience with the, with the greatest generation mm -hmm. and uh, I, I will was too young <laughs> to right. be in the yeah. Second World War. But my father and my uncles mm -hmm. and everybody sure. was, and they rarely, rarely, right. rarely spoke of yeah. it. And, and if you could pry it out of them at a mm -hmm. Fourth of July picnic late in the day, right. but otherwise, no. But you've carried forward. The last two novels are both connected to the last 14 years of mm -hmm. America's wars. One novel... Uh, about terrorism, or the first, the, the earlier one, a, a drone pilot, mm -hmm. and then the, the most recent one right. about terrorism. Drone pilot sits in Tampa, right? Op piloting a drone, mm -hmm. 
yeah. over Afghanistan? In the early years of the war, this was the case. They fly them in theater now, by and large, or at least they're isolated at bases out west, but in the early years. So uh, there was a lot of civilian pilots flying these, Don, and they were driving from the suburbs of Tampa, very normal lives, to fly these things for 12 hours on the opposite side of the planet and then driving back, right? And the work was largely secret. You couldn't go home and talk to your wife right. or your children or anybody about this. You were being jerked out of, out of a theater, out of combat, possibly having killed someone, back to helping your children and with homework. could you get PTSD Absolutely from being could. a drone yeah. pilot? Yeah, so I talked to a number of uh -huh. people. And in the early years, um, psychologists were baffled why these pilots were having this sort of reaction. And then it occurred to them that this is just as real as anything else, right? This mm -hmm. is the consequences are very real, even if you're watching it on a two-dimension screen. Right. Um, yeah. I, I, I started thinking about the drone as such an embodiment of contemporary American life where so much of our lives are by proxy. There's so much that works to, to sort of disembody us, right? The idea that we have these projected online personas, that our wars are fought by a tiny percentage of the population far away, and they often seem bloodless, unless, of course, you're on the other end, right, right. of one of those strikes. Um, the drone just felt like America. Well, it drives that man crazy. Sure, yeah. In fact, your protagonist, sometimes they're not even the protagonist, mm -hmm. but a variety of usually male characters mm -hmm. in your novels have suffer from guilt. Right. This, you learned that at Yale, did you? <laughs> <laughs> no, Yale worked to get rid of that. You should have met me before Yale. Um, you know, I think part of that is growing up in the very religious South as someone who was extremely idealistic and in many ways extremely naive. And um, I believed in all of those things that a Southern boy is taught. And then when you see the reality of the world, that's, I think that's shocking. That's difficult to deal with. So there's, there's a guilt that's worn um, deep that sort of threads through all of yeah. those books and then there's a sort of guilt that runs I think um, a kind of post 9-11 guilt that should probably run through all of our country. I remember seeing the, the images from Abu Ghraib for the first time and thinking you know if this doesn't collectively um, if this doesn't change something deep in American culture there's something wrong with American culture. Well that's culture. in one of your early novels. Yeah the third the, the, novel. The Abu yeah, Ghraib. Absolutely. And did it change American culture? No I don't think it, I don't no, think it I don't did. Think I don't so think either. it did at all and see no. and that, again I think that's my the naivety that I can't quite ever get over. Something, one, one notices patterns after a while mm -hmm. in a writer's work. Sure. You have siblings, Yeah. sometimes pairs of siblings, mm -hmm. and, and in the sheltering you have um, a pair of brothers yes. and a pair of sisters. Mm -hmm. And obviously there's something about the chemistry, mm -hmm. interaction, family dynamics right. that interests you because yeah. you go there mm -hmm. often. I, I grew up in a big family and the people I'm closest to I think remain you know my siblings mm -hmm. um, so it's always just a, a relationship that that interests me and again it's I like to think that it's maybe more peculiar to the south than it is I don't think that's probably the case but large families that stay very close that's that's been my experience and I'm always a little baffled when I meet people who come from who have multiple siblings and say we talk you know a couple times a year or something that's not at all my experience <laughs> no. we talk way too much um, I got a really late night phone call last night, which I had to hang up on because I was too sleepy to, to just talk and ramble, you know, for a half hour. Um, yeah. But one, uh, what you have the, the two pairs in the sheltering, mm -hmm. you have the, the two girls, and one mm -hmm. becomes, loosely speaking, a religious fanatic. Right. One becomes a political activist mm -hmm. fanatic. Yeah. And then the two boys, Bobby and Donnie, mm -hmm. One has been to war, right. the other has been to prison. Yeah. Obviously you mean for these all to fit sure. in certain kinds of right. ways. Yeah, and I think in so many ways, you know, what I write inadvertently becomes a form of autobiography or a form of sort of projected selves. Uh. You know, I mean, there's I, I go to divinity school as, as pretty deeply religious and I come out of it as pretty politically active. Um, and it's hard for me now to see the difference between the two, right? If it's, if belief isn't just your, your actions, then I'm not sure what it is, right? Author Miller said the Bible means justice, the Bible means nothing at all. Um, and then there's this notion of, you know, I, I taught for several years at a prison. Meanwhile, I watched my friends, particularly from the Citadel, rotate in and out of, mm -hmm. uh, out of combat zones. So again, I'm kind of experiencing these things at one remove, but I'm seeing 
close hand the consequences of what happens. And that's, again, that's just me trying to make sense of the world. Well, making sense of the world in echolocation mm-hmm. is going to take some doing. <laughs> because it is a collection of horrors, it's a collection of errors, of Mm -hmm. misunderstandings. John Maynard is a psychologist. Mm -hmm. He's hired as a contractor by the U.S. military, Mm -hmm. and he works in a black site in Poland, Mm -hmm. Slovakia, Poland, Poland, and tortures people. Right. Now, I didn't have any trouble with that at all. Mm -hmm. Well, that's done, maybe put (laughs) <laughs> Let me put that differently. Right. I did not have any trouble understanding his terrible sense of guilt. Right. Because he he had not planned on becoming mm-hmm. a professional torturer. Sure. You must have strong feelings about as early as Abu Ghraib and then mm-hmm. later with sure. waterboarding and so on. Yeah. I mean, I was just uh, the same response to what went on during those Bush years and, and into the Obama years, too, was just an absolute revulsion. And... I think that has to do with the ideas of, of deeply believing in these American values, um, failing to recognize that much of this is just simply talk, right? This, that you shouldn't, you shouldn't swallow it quite as deeply as I swallowed it. Um, right now, there's a case to psychologists who are contractor, uh, contractors no. are on trial um, for more or less what happened with John Maynard. It was a slow building case built by the Justice Department. Um, and be doing what they were told to doing do, what they were and, told to, right. and paid to do, right. is not a defense. Uh, well, that remains to be seen. Uh-huh. Yeah, I, I mean, and that's what I wanted to try to convey in the right. book: is not that this guy is a, a villain. He was doing what he started out doing, what he knew was right, and gradually he went down that slippery slope where he became uncertain and he became more uncertain. But he had a job to do. And he was doing the job he was sent to do by the American people, who yeah. remember, by and large have not voiced a large opposition to this. Um, no, no. No, I think one of the, the, your last two books especially, although there's plenty of discussion of conscience and ethics mm-hmm. and guilt in the first three, right. but the last two are studies in uh, secular ethics, mm-hmm. studies in contemporary and malleable right. ethics. That, that was clear to me why John Maynard um, was utterly distressed. I mm-hmm. did not understand as well why his wife, his wife develops an obsession right. with watching YouTube videos mm-hmm. of captured Westerners. Right. Why, why is that? What's that? Yeah, what do know. you mean by that? <laughs> I don't, that's another great question. <laughs> I can tell you that when I was writing this, or when I first started writing this, uh, my family and I, we were living in Slovakia and Eastern Europe, and we were watching, this was 2014, we were watching American and French jets pound um, ISIS targets outside the Syrian city of Kobani. And I, for years, ever since divinity school, had considered myself a pacifist. And I, and I really believed that in watching those bombs fall on. What I felt myself uh-huh. thinking over and over was, yes, destroy them, kill them, wipe them out. And when I realized that was my response, it really, it, it frightened me. Yeah. I felt like I almost went down, um, I, I sort of went down a rabbit hole of wanting to examine this thing. We all are characters in The Lord of the Flies. Left alone, right. we will revert yeah. to kill the pig, yeah. <laughs> bomb, bomb, bomb the enemy, and other savagery. Yeah. He, in spite of all of your reservations, um, and they're ethical and practical mm-hmm. about, about drone warfare and about, about uh, extreme uh, interrogation and so on, the terrorist threat in mm-hmm. <coughs> echolocation is real. Right. There yeah. are. Yes. In the novel, there yeah. are terrorists in the United States actively yes. working and yeah. they would do us harm. Absolutely. Yeah. And I mean that's the the difficulty of the situation. And the thing about drone warfare is while in many ways it's repulsive, it's also probably kept a lot of us alive. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and you know, and that's I, I think that's what literature is for is to play out these these situations that right. get in that really messy ethically gray area and try oh, to mess around. Yeah. I don't think your novels are going to solve this, <laughs> no, but they right. will open it of up course, to, yeah. to scrutiny. Yeah. We only have two minutes. Yes. And even though echolocation is brand new, mm-hmm. you are already deep at work in another novel. Yes. Uh, I'm finishing up a book. Um, echolocation actually started as a, as a much larger book, and it's, uh, the book was chopped in half. So the second uh-huh. half, uh, it deals uh, mainly with the war in Ukraine. 
um, and uh, fracking of, ga of natural gas in Eastern Europe and how U.S. multinationals are sort of involved in this and to the extent to which conflict in Eastern Europe um, makes a lot of people really, really rich. Uh, Eastern Europeans, Russians, uh, no, Americans? Uh, Americans and Russians. <laughs> Multinationals <laughs> in the United States and Russia. So if nothing else, I feel like it's timely. Um, I have a, uh, a billionaire hedge fund manager who, with eyes on the presidency, which was just a uh, maybe the one happy consequence of, of our recent political uh, season. When did you start writing this? I started writing this uh, in 2014 when we were in Slovakia. Well, you're prescient then. Or you <laughs> well, could give I was, us advance warning. Yeah, I, well, I, I told my wife, you know, I didn't mean for this to happen. I just, if, if, even if it helped sales, it was just a novel. I would have preferred it to have remained fictitious. What? And so th will that be set, that novel will be set in D.C.? Uh, in it moves between D.C., uh, New York, Kiev, Eastern uh -huh, Ukraine, uh -huh. um, Budapest, various places throughout Eastern Europe. Yeah, great. So, well, it should be a year or two. And I hope when so. When it's out, I'll read it and we'll talk about that it. That sounds wonderful. Thank you very much. This has been a pleasure. My pleasure, Don. Thank you for having me. After the taping of this episode, the title of Mark Powell's new novel, Echo Location, was changed to Small Treasons. We apologize for any confusion. <laughs>